So um, in my presentation, I will talk about the rule of rift inheritance in building collision origins. And I will take the perspective from the Bay of Biscay, Pyrenean and Alps. Uh, so the, the first question obviously is what is the link between origins, margins and, uh, and oceans? And actually it's interesting to note that uh, rifted margins and oceans have been described uh, before they've been imaged and drilled in present day oceans on rifted margins. It's because some of the alpine geologists like uh, Steinmann, uh, Argon, uh, or uh, Julio Elter, uh, they actually, actually looked at the rocks in the Alps and they described them as oceanic remnants. And they came to the conclusions that alpine type origins result from the implication of former rifted margins and intervening oceanic basins. This was a long time ago. Uh, and uh, they could not really understand what oceans were and how did they got involved in uh, origins. That was much later with the advent of plate tectonics and uh, the understanding of the Wilson cycle uh, that it became clear how that you can go from an origin like the Briskin through rifting back into an origin like the Alps in Western Europe. And uh, so this was a major learning and uh, there are key points that we need to take out of these learnings. The first one is that each stage provides an inheritance to the subsequent stage. That means that we need to understand who was before and, and what did they give to the next one. And this leads to the question about what is really inheritance? How can we define rift inheritance? And how does this really control, uh, for instance, the orogenic event? Okay, so if this is really important, the question is, why did we not speak a lot about this before? And um, actually there are two main reasons. The first reason is that we get only very recently images of rifted margins that allowed us to really understand these structures on a crust scale. It is in particular the distal parts of rifted margins that are important for origins. Actually, in the previous studies of origins, a lot of studies were looking at for the thrust bands. They form over the proximal parts of margins and they are not heavily impacted by the inheritance, and that is the structure of the thermal inheritance. And the subduction zones mainly involve the oceanic domains, but not really these distal parts of rifted margins. Uh, so actually, it's important to note that uh, to understand the internal parts of origins, we need to understand these early stages of, or let's say the, the previous, the stages of the rifted margin as they were before they were reactivated. Uh, there are some things that we need to take care about when we talk about rifted margins and inheritance. The first one was just to what uh, Julia was talking about, is the magmatic budget. Uh, we know that we do not find volcanic margins in origins, which suggests they are reactivated in a different way like magma pool margins. The other thing that is important is the width of the oceanic domains. Uh, if oceanic domains are wide, like for instance, between India and Eurasia, uh, you get big subduction zones, you get arcs, you destroy the upper plate and you only keep the rift inheritance in the downgoing lower plate, so in the Indian plate. Uh, what is if you have uh, narrow oceans like in the Alpine domain? You actually have the collision of margins, you do not have arcs, and you actually have a lot of inheritance. There is a last point that we need to take care of. That's what I learned by working with my colleagues in the South China Sea, like Trimei Zhang. It's actually that uh, marginal type systems are very different from Atlantic type systems. Marginal, marginal type systems that are related to the subduction zones, they're actually very fast. You can shift very fast from uh, orogenic to rift or from rift to convergence. Uh, they're not equilibrated, whereas Atlantic type systems are actually very slow. Uh, they're equilibrated. Uh, so they're much easier to understand. So what I'm going to do now is to go to the Bay of Biscay, Pyrenean Alpine system. Uh, this is actually a magma pool system. It's linked to narrow oceans. Uh, 
uh, and it corresponds to an Atlantic type system. So it's actually the easiest system to study. Well, if we are looking at these systems, this is a, a kinematic uh, restoration of uh, Frasca. Uh, you see that these systems are actually quite complex uh, by themselves. Um, at the junction between the Atlantic and the Tethys, uh, we have multiple protoceanic domains that form from the Triassic over the Jurassic into the Upper Jurassic, Lower Cretaceous. Uh, and we get to a very complex evolution of this system. Uh, what I'm showing here on this map here is the restoration of Gianluca at 83 million years. Uh, it shows actually the width of these domains. Um, and you can see that in green, and these are what we would call the subductible ma material. These are hyperextended, exhumed, and oceanic domains. They're very complex, very, very segmented in the alpine area. Uh, so what I try to show you now is actually how did these domains reactivated and how the rift structures controlled the subsequent convergence. So uh, I will bring you first to the Basque Cantabrian basin, uh, the Monio basin and the termination of the Bay of Biscay. So uh, the green is the geomantle, uh, violet is the hyperextended domain, dark gray is the neck domain, and uh, here you have two sections. The western section, which is through the Asturias, and the central section here that is through the Basque and Tabra Basin. Uh, actually, uh, what we did here is that we, uh, we um, constructed these sections using the geophysical data, and we restored them back to the pre-rift stage. We did this by uh, conserving the surface of the crust and by conserving also the length of the pre-rift. That's quite important. And what you can see here is an evolution through polyphase rifting. Uh, very important, the Triassic rifting that um, is related to salt deposition here in pink, and then the hyperextension during the early Cretaceous, and then the reactivation. Um, there are two important things that we can see in this example. We can see that actually the hyperextended domains and exhumed domains, they are pulling out and pull back. So you actually uh, reactivate the rift structures that you use actually the detachments to restore. But when you go to the so-called coupling points, which are actually the areas, the termination of the necking zones where the cross get less than 10 kilometers, you start actually to, uh, to, 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 to form buttresses and you start to get into the collision. Uh, this can be seen on both margins and we can actually note the importance of coupling points of necking zones uh, during the reactivation. Uh, what is in front of the necking zones is, can be subducted or accreted. What is in the back is uh, actually forming as uh, buttresses in the origin. And the other important point is the, that the reactivation uses rift-related decoupling levels. Okay, let's uh, go a little bit to the east. Now in the Basque and Tabern Basin, and this is the Moyon, so this is just uh, the boundary between France and Spain. And uh, what we get in there is a segmented hyperextended domain. And this section in here is showing actually a section uh, that goes across these two basins. And what we can find is that here we do not have now sediments in, in between the two uh, crosses, like before in the Basque Tower Basin, but we have a block of continent. And if we restore this, this is actually a, a ribbon uh, that is surrounded by two hyperextended domains. And during the convergence, this ribbon is starting to become the part, the central part of the origin. So we preserve actually the distal part of the margin. Um, if we make a, a sequential section through this domain, so this is the west, this is the Moyon Basin, this is this one and to the west, we have the Basque and Tauron Basin, this is this one, we can actually see that uh, the two basins, they're completely uh, reactivated, uh, and the, the center of the, of the reactivated domain is made up by sediments. 
Whereas if we go in between, uh, we see that actually the center is made up by this ribbon. And there is an interesting point that uh, the thrusts that are in the Molio, they try to link up with the thrusts that are in the Basque Cantabrian Basin. And by doing so, uh, the, the, the hyperextended domain and the mantle become part of the hanging wall of the thrust, and therefore stay back into the origin. And this is the way that we can actually understand why that we have uh, exhumed mantle and hyperextended domains that stay back into the origin. Um, you've used about 10 minutes now. Yeah, that's good. Uh, now, um, this is uh, the second last slide. Uh, I do not aim to explain you the Alps. They are too complex. I could spend a lot of time doing so. Uh, this is just a paper that we published last week, uh, so you can find it. Uh, but what I try to show here is a, a section that is through the Western Alps. And I try just to show you that we see very similar things than what we saw just before. In the Western Alps, we have a sort of a ribbon, the Brionsone ribbon. This ribbon was between two hyperextended domains. And during the convergence, we can see that this ribbon was actually less deformed and the more deformed domains were those that were uh, deformed in between. Well, we can map actually these uh, coupling points, the netting zones for Western Europe, but also for the Adriatic system. We can restore these domains back to 45 million years with the model of Gianluca. And we can actually show the situation at the day before we went to collision in the Alps. And you see that actually the, the geometries are very complex. You can see that Adri moves towards the north, it gets locally to first collision, but you have still domains like the Valin or the ribbons that are not yet affected by the deformation. And you can see that there is a very complex evolution where you move to the north and this valley is starting to retreat. Uh, you have local uh, kinematic top to the west directions that are actually local and that are related to the, um, to, to the fact that you have meant in this dense, this domain. And you get to the complete closure over a domain that is very complex. So what we can see is actually the major thrust structures are linked to uh, locations where the crust was either necked or hyperextended. We can see that the orogenic roots are controlled by rift inherited marginal structures and that the lateral variation along the alt is not cylindrical, uh, but is actually uh, controlled by rift inheritance that is amplified by orogenic processes. So to conclude, uh, we can see that the rule of rift inheritance in building collision origins has two aspects. One is a global one. Uh, we see that the width of the oceans is important. We can also see that the magmatic budget of the margins is important. Uh, we can see that with no ocean, we cannot form a subduction and that marginal systems are different from Atlantic type systems. On a very regional scale, we can see that necking zones are very important. Necking zones are the limit between domains that are subductible, uh, where you can accrete, and domains where you are forming buttresses. Uh, we can also see that 3D geometries are important. Uh, uh, segmented systems behave very different. Segment centers subduct. Uh, segment boundaries uh, form more complex structures and preserve part of the margins. And we can also see that the initial stage of collision strongly depends on the rift inheritance. So thank you. These are some of the papers. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Jared. <laughs> um, that, that was a fantastic talk. Uh, does anyone have any question for Jared? Sasha, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for this nice talk, Tanredo. I'm, I'm wondering a bit about the um, inheritance of these coupling points and how the rheology of the crust plays a role in that one. Um, are, are these preserved as just the coupling, the area where you have coupling and decoupling, or are they, do they have another role where the weaknesses of the fault is um, changing the, the strength of the lithosphere? 
Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. Actually, um, if you look at, um, at the Alps, for instance, if you are in front of the, of the, of the necking zone of the scalping point, uh, the basement is very strongly hydrated, the concrete basement as well as the mantle, and you have very hydrated um, rocks. So, so it's not only the falls that are weak, uh, but also the, the whole cross is weak and it's very thin. It is also actually, if you want, if you go to cross six kilometers, it's not very different in density from the oceanic cross. Uh, whereas if you go on the continent ward side of the scalping point, you get cross that is wedging, that is thicker. Uh, the mantle is not hydrated and the lower crust is welded to the mantle. So, so this, this, uh, this coupling point is actually really, uh, I would say, um, uh, a limit where the rheology of the crust uh, and the link between crust and mantle is really changing. And so therefore I think that, uh, yeah, this is why this point becomes so important during convergence. And would you say that you can define this kind of coupling point also for volcanic margins, like in the talk we saw by Julia before? Yeah, I think that the, the problem of volcanic margins is that we do not understand so well the, the structure of volcanic margins. We, we understand the SDRs. We do not see where the contour crust is wedging out. And, uh, and we do not understand the underplates. But uh, let's say I would expect that... Uh, also in volcanic mountains, uh, there is a sort of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, point which is a weakness. But let's say this is probably something that we need to look further. And I think that uh, Julia and Manu, they are on the good direction to find good candidates uh, to study this. Great, thank you. Um, Janet, I have a question. So I understand that a lot of these ideas are based on seismic interpretations. Um, what are your thoughts on the influence of system inheritance on, you know, on um, um, mountain building mm -hmm. and um, rifted margins? What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's uh, it's not completely true that this is built on seismic interpretations only. It says <laughs> Because actually, my I started to work in the Alps, and and, okay. and I was surprised to find remnants of rift margins in the Alps. And and I I, but at the very beginning, I was trying to find the 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 pre-Alpine story. But at one point, we uh, the the question became why are they preserved, and why are some parts better preserved than other parts? And and so so that was actually I would say that it's. Uh, if I did in my first 20 years, uh, uh, I went to origins to from origins to margins. It's actually the way back, and uh, and it turns out actually that um, that uh, for instance the Alps uh, get much more simple if you introduce inheritance because um, but we need to be careful not to introduce inheritance to just to make it simple. But to introduce in a, in a, I would say in a, in, a, in a conceptual correct way inheritance in the way to 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 uh, to understand uh, origins because uh, the the difficulty is actually that um, it's obvious that the Alps were a rifted margin. It's obvious that that there are a lot of candidates to be reactivated, but we need actually to to try to understand the sort of systematics. And I think that with this, uh, that we are about to do it. Thank uh, you. It's also important for, uh, for modeling, obviously, because it I agree. it's the initial condition of a model. Right. Yeah, I was just asking about the thermal, the thermal part, but I, I guess that's also difficult to constrain. Yeah. Well, I think for the Alpine, for the Atlantic type systems, it's more simple because uh, Alp, uh, Atlantic type systems are thermally equilibrated. Most of them are thermally equilibrated when they go to convergence. But that becomes a big issue if you work in systems like South China Sea, because these systems are not thermally equilibrated. Uh, and therefore, they're much more complex. So, so I think that therefore starting Atlantic type systems is more easy. And uh, that's why we, why, why, in a way, it's not so complex. Makes sense. 
Thank you very much. 